You're watching the Film Fix. You're big. Fought bigger. You're watching the film fix. I'm Jeff Marker here with Jonathan Hickman, and we just got done taking a look at Thor, which is uh, Marvel Comics and Paramount's big setup for a series of movies. Really, yep. this is leading up to the uh, Avengers and Captain America. So we're going to decide whether this is a, a worthy start to that whole series of movies. Yeah, and, and this is the start really of the summer season. I mean, last week we saw uh, Fast Five, and uh, you know, hey, I mean, that was a loud movie. That was a summer movie disguised Gosh. for April. <laughs> Gosh, Thor is so loud. It yeah. is almost deafening. All right, so. so we'll talk about the story and we'll talk about what it's like to actually sit in the theater while this thing is playing. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, tell us what it's about. The beginning of the, the setup for Thor, you have to keep in mind that you know Marvel Comics is sort of jumping headlong into movie production they're basically taking all of their characters and transferring them onto uh, the screen but they have some problems to deal with some of their stories are purely supernatural uh, genuine superheroes but then you have things like Iron Man those movies are also Marvel and so you got Tony Stark's, uh, Stark who does everything with technology and so what Thor is trying to do is sort of bridge those two parts of the whole Marvel Universe and this is basically how they do it uh, we begin with, well, the movie begins with, you know, some strange occurrence out in the desert. You might remember that from uh, the end of one of the Iron Man movies. And then we sort of flash into this alternate universe where it's, you know, Odin is the, the, the king and he's a god played by Anthony Hopkins. And his sons are, of course, Thor and Loki. And, and uh, Chris Hemsworth plays... Uh, plays Thor here and the you know the movie revolves around him but then Loki is the mischievous son and so they are sort of in charge of these nine realms uh, earth is one of those realms and so it is highly supernatural and there ends up being this very Shakespearean uh, sort of court battle between Thor and Loki and it revolves around this fight with uh, the these frost giants which is another realm and Thor ends up being exiled out of that world onto Earth. And so there you go. There's the bridge between this alternate universe and the Earth that we know. And so it sort of plays out that you know Thor's trying to get back to, uh, to the court and, uh, and Loki is trying to maneuver his way to the throne. Meanwhile, Thor is here on Earth and, uh, and has lost his powers. He's trying to get back that big hammer. And you know, Natalie Portman is the the person who finds him, and wouldn't you know, those two very pretty people start to fall in love while all this is happening. So Thor was never a book in the Marvel Universe that I read. I, I was uh, more into uh, X-Men and, of course, Spider-Man, the amazing Spider-Man, spectacular Spider-Man, all of the uh, various incarnations of Spider-Man. Um, Thor, to me, at least, you know, when I heard they were doing this, um, and I've been saying this for months, I just didn't think they could make it work. Uh, I thought, you know, this whole mythical, fantastic angle, uh, along with the whole superhero, especially given the practical side of Tony Stark, I just didn't think that they could make it credible. But you know what? I've seen it, and I think they make it work. Now, there's, a, there's an ample amount of cheese and corniness uh, that uh, is required in order to buy everything that's going on, but it also helps that you've got Odin, played by Anthony Hopkins. It, uh, this Chris Hemsworth guy is very, very, keeps a stern upper lip. He's very, very good in the role. Uh, mm -hmm. Natalie Portman, you yeah. know? And so the cast really helps, all the way down to Stellan uh, uh, Skarsgård, who's very good. Kat Dennings is, is, is even uh, has a, a minor relief. role. Yeah, she mm -hmm. gives us some of the best laughs in the movies. In the movie, so 
Yeah, it, they, they do manage to bridge it. But, you know, that's not the only thing that they that was sort of unexpected for this movie. We've got Kenneth Branagh right. directing a superhero movie. And so Branagh, of course, is better known for his uh, his Shakespearean adaptations. That's right, instead of Stan Lee, which right. is the Stan Lee here, adaptations, course, yeah. Only, yeah, Jack Kirby and so forth. Yeah. So. And it works, it, it works at some sometimes and it doesn't. You're going to have to just buy the fact that this is going to sound like, you know, Henry IV Part One or Two, or Richard III at times, and yet people are throwing hammers around and knocking frost giants into the into oblivion you know yeah. it's, it's a strange combination that may work for some and, and not for others well and I'm sure that there'll be this this will get a lot of detractors uh, Thor is uh, a superhero movie and some people some critics can never buy the whole superhero thing so you know you just got to take that with a grain, grain of salt I grew up reading the comic books you and I are almost exactly the same age and you did not grow up reading comic books no. and I know when I was a kid there was no one that I could turn to in my little community uh, who actually read and got into these stories. So now that I'm able to find that, and at our screening there were so many die-hard comic fans, they were debating uh, the particular changes from the comic book to the movie afterwards, I think that this is going to have a, a real groundswell around it. Because it's a decent enough movie. Uh, for people to actually go see that aren't even into comics, but the right. people who are really into it are going to be really into it. And it can appeal to a really broad range of viewers, too. We, we, we uh, noticed that it's a PG-13 movie, but I'm not even sure it deserves the 13. I took my 7-year-old, and it could have been PG. I mean, the movie is, movie is very, very clean, uh, and it has a wholesome message, I think. Uh, I mean, I, I think I think it works very broadly. And we did, and we make this distinction between realistic violence and uh, and comic book violence. And there's really no realistic violence here. It's all comic book. It's you know. And the other thing to point out is this movie is really um, it's as much animated as it is live action. That's right. When they're on Earth, of course, it's live action. But then as soon as they go to uh, you know this this other realm, then it's all green screen work and it's all animated landscapes and, and, and that so really it is almost as much of an animated movie as live action well and the quality of the animation is certainly fine I mean they didn't spare any expense in making this movie I think the great misstep and you and I are going to have a debate about this is the use of uh, post uh, 3D or post conversion 3D which I assume is what they've done here yeah. the stereoscopic post and what irritates me about it is how uh, dim uh, the Asgard uh, place looks. Uh, it's very difficult to make certain things out. Every wide shot in Asgard is positively out of focus, and that's very irritating. Yeah, uh, it's you know, and this is why I'm having trouble getting excited about it. The, the 3D, there, there's sometimes when we say that it's not worth paying for, it, but at this point, in this case, it ruins the movie. It Almost. really does. Yeah. I think the story could work, the, the acting is fine, the dialogue isn't as cheesy as a lot of uh, comic book movies, and they have a good bit of fun, but I watched half of it without the glasses on because it was so dark, I was, have, I was training to even see what was it's going on. It's remarkable. Um, I mean, you know, what happens is, I guess what they do is they over... I don't know anything about this post-3D uh, uh, conversion, but um, when you take the glasses off where you clearly realize that certain parts of it are not in 3D, and you take the glasses off, everything is much brighter, uh, much more pleasing to the eye, and much sharper. Uh, obviously, uh, at times when they go to the 3D, it's impossible to watch without the glasses because it is very, very, very uh, blurry. But for the most part, I, I wish they hadn't have done it. And I would encourage people who do go see the movie not to pay the added price for the 3D ticket. No, like we say, it's it's not only is it not worth it, you will be disappointed if you watch it in 3D versus 2D. Yeah, and I, I think it's safe to say that if I had paid the 3D price for this, I may not have given it a fixed rating. Yeah. Uh, which, of course, I'm going to say that I did get my fix from Thor. How about you? I'll say, I'll say I got my fix in 2D. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's safe to say. But honestly, I, ha I have a bit of a headache just from having to look and strain so much to, uh, to see it. And, you know, it's not like I'm, you know, losing, going blind or something like that. My eyesight is fine. And so I think most viewers would sit here and just, just you, you know, hurt looking at this thing. And I wish they would just drop this 3D craze. Yeah, I mean, done or, or shoot it in 3D, which, you know, is what uh, what we saw with Avatar, and it's what we're going to see moving forward with James Cameron's work. But uh, You know, he recently, for Avatar 2, what did he purchase, 50 uh, of these uh, of these red cameras, just like Peter Jackson did? Uh, you know, so so we'll see uh, we'll see how it goes from here. Well, um, Interesting that you bring up Peter Jackson, because yeah. here's our great hope. 
Peter Jackson is filming The Hobbit in Maxivision 48, which gives you right. all the resolution, all the contrast ratio, and all the brightness, the illumination that you can get with this, and you can do it in 3D. Everybody go see that when it comes out. I don't care if you like The Hobbit books or not. Just support a different format from, from 3D digital. Well, and uh, I, so I, I, I want to end this. I <laughs> know, really. I want to end this with a look at uh, one of the other films that's opening, I believe, in July, because uh, we're going to have three months of superhero films here. Yeah. We're going to have Thor that starts it, and that's in May. And then in June, we're going to have X Men First Class, as well as the DC movie, The Green Lantern. Yeah. And then in, uh, in July, we're going to get to see uh, Captain America, uh, the first Avenger. So your, your optimism is the only thing that's going to to get me through this summer. Do you know that, right? I mean, hey, you know, I mean, I think we're in for a lot. I'm really hopeful that Captain America and X-Men First Class are going to be something special. Uh, so you can always join us on the web by going to dailyfilmfix.com where you can feed your movie addiction. Uh, but let's take it away with the trailer for uh, the, uh, the Captain America, the First Avenger, or Captain America, First Avenger. Rogers, Steven. Just give me a chance. Sorry, son. I'm saving your life. General Patton has said that wars are fought with weapons, but they are won by men. You just don't know when to give up, do you? I could do this all day. Our goal is to create the greatest army in history. I should be going with you. Look, I know you don't think I can do this. This isn't a back alley, Steve. It's war. But every army begins with one man. Five tries in five different cities. I can offer you a chance. He will be the first in a new breed of super soldiers. Why me? Because the weak man knows the value of strength, knows the value of power. That wasn't so bad. That was penicillin. We are going to win this war because we have the best men. Now, Mr. Stark. And they will personally escort Adolf Hitler to the gates of hell. How do you feel? Your task won't be simple. Who the hell are you? The first of many. Your enemy is not what you expect. This is why you were chosen. What do you think? I think it works.